ho kai nei o taku tapu wai. Ko te ho kai nuku, ko te ho kai rangi, ko te ho kai nei o tō tipuna, a tū mataoenga. Taku tapu wai, ko taku tapu wai nui nā tāne nui a rangi. I piki te ai te rangi tū hā te tihi o mā no no. I roko hina atu rā ko i o te matua kore anake. Ka ariro iho ko ngā kete o te wānanga. Ko te kete tu auri, ko te kete tu atea, ko te kete arunui. Ka tiri tiri a ka papau a ki papa tu wānuku. Ka puta te ira tangata ki te whai iao, ki te ao mārama. Whano, whano, haramai te toki haumie, hui e, whai ki e. Ko te mihi tua tahi ki te mātua nui i te rangi. Nā nei hanga te whenua, nā nei hanga te rangi, nā nei hanga i ngā mea katoa. E honore he karoria ki te atua, mau ngā rongo ki te whenua, whakaaro pai ki ngā tānga takatoa i tēnei rā. Ki ngā mana o te whenua nei, tirunanga o tākau, taino ki kāti huira pa ki pita ke te raki, me moira ki hoki, ko tēnei te mihi ki a koutou, a mō tautoko i tēnei kaupapa pakahirahira o te pō nei. O reira ki a koutou ngā mana o tēnei whenua, tēnei te mihi, ko tēnei te mihi, ko tēnei te mihi. Ki te whare e tū nei, te whare wānanga o tākau, te whare wānanga o rātou te ihi, te wehi, te mātauranga, te mataku. Engari i tēnei rā, e whare wānanga he tautoko ana i tēnei kaupapa whakahirahira. Mō reira ki te whare e tū nei. Tēnā koe. Ki ngā mate o te wā, te marama, o te tau. Ki ngā mate e kua whetsurangi tia ki pōhu te kaua, i raro i te koro wai o te manaaki o matariki. Kua tangi hia, kua tukua, nō reira haere, haere, haere. Hiri nō ki a tātou te hunga ora, ki a koutou katoa e mātakitaki mai, ko tēnei te mihiana ki a koutou, nai mai, hara mai, Tauti mai, a ki tēnei kaupapa whakaihirahira i te whare wānanga o tākau. Ka nui te koa, ka nui te ngā kau, ka nui te harikoa, ki te kite i te maha o koutou e whakaata mai, a ki tēnei kaupapa e ki, e pāna ki te oritetanga, e hoki i te kore, oritetanga hoki. O reira ki a koutou katoa e mātakitaki mai, piri noa ki ngā pau o te mātauranga e kōrero i roto i tēnei whare wānanga i te pō nei, nai mai. Ara mai, tauti mai. Ka huri a hau i nāinei ki tō mātou kai whakahaere a tākuta Wayne te kāwa, engari mai a hau, mai te whare wānanga o tākau hoki, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. So tahi tēnei te mihi atu ki a koe rae e takutua kana mo tō karekea he whakatau i a tātou i tēnei ahi ahi pō o reira tēnā koe e ngā tika hunamu. Kia ora, no mai haramai, welcome to this fourth instalment of the Winter Symposium here at the University of Otago. Inequality in Aotearoa, woof, what a subject, eh? This is one of the major issues that have been facing this country for, oh, mai rā no, for years and years and years, and successive governments have tried to, tried to address this issue of inequality, but what's happened? Oh, it just seems to be growing and growing and growing in education and health, housing, um, the legal system. The gaps seem to be getting wider and wider between those who have and those who have not. That's our topic for tonight. And guess what? We have an awesome as panel here tonight. Um, some of the best thinkers in the country are here tonight. When these people speak, people listen. And you should listen to what they've got to say tonight. Because people take notice of what they have to say. Government, government departments, social service organizations. Hey, even University of Otago listens to them because they've all got jobs here. <laughs> so listen closely to what they have to say. Now, let me introduce our awesome as panel to my right. She is the president of Otago University Students Association. Melissa Lama, Malo Lele, Malo Lele. Our president, 20,000 students she represents. When she speaks, she speaks on behalf of 20,000 students. PhD student doing her doctorate, mother of two, and she's been an advocate since the age of five. That's amazing. Malo Lele. Mm -hmm. To my right, to my far right, is Professor Richie Poulton. 
he needs no introduction. Director of the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Research Unit, and get this, Chief Science Advisor to the Ministry of Social Development. I'm gonna say that again, Chief Science Advisor to the Ministry of Social Development. He is the man. To my far left is Associate Professor Helen Roberts, Otago Business School, an expert in accountancy and finance, director of the Masters of Finance program, deputy director of the Climate Energy Finance Group. You kind of get the picture that Professor, Associate Professor Helen Roberts knows her way around money. <laughs> to my immediate left is Professor Philippa Chap uh, Philippa Heldon Chapman. Now, not just a professor, get this, distinguished professor, hey, distinguished professor. The, you've got to be better than a professor to get to, get to that level. Co-director of Hekainga Order, director of the New Zealand Centre for Sustainable Cities. If I were to continue reading out all the achievements by Philippa, I'd be sitting here until midnight tonight. And the, the next member of our panel, Shane Walker. I've known Shane for many, many years. We were students together back in the 1990s. Shane was doing social work. I was doing theology. 1990s, I'm talking about last century. That's how long we've known each other. And Shane is a senior lecturer in the, in the social and community work program. Poverty is an issue that Shane is passionate about care and protection. He's passionate about those social services. He has a passion about this. And get this, when the government launched its report on Oranga Tamiriki last year, I think it was, I was watching the news and who was reading the report? Shane Walker. What an awesome panel we've got tonight. These are our, our, our panelists tonight. The process is quite simple. I'm going to invite each of our panel members to speak for about five minutes on the topic of inequality in, in Aotearoa. They may ruffle a few feathers, they may throw out a few challenges, and at the end of it all, we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion. And then we're going to take your questions because your questions, your views are important to us. So as you can see, we have an awesome panel. We have a difficult topic. We're not here to look pretty. We're not here to, to sound nice. We may ruffle a few feathers. We may take it to the edge. And why not? This is the Winter Symposium of Otago University. So let's get the ball rolling. Our first speaker tonight, OUSA President, Melissa Lama. Malo Lele. Oh, Malo Lele, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, and Malo Lele to all our panelists as well. Um, as mentioned, my name is Melissa Lama. And um, very grateful to have this opportunity to give my views around inequality in Aotearoa. And so in my thoughts and preparation uh, for this talk, I was trying to think of what's, what's relative to me in regards to inequality in Aotearoa. And I think the best perspective to give is, is that of someone who, I guess it is an end user of a lot of the policies and, and government uh, initiatives and strategies that come out, but also as someone in my current position, um, as a president, as someone doing a doctorate, as a mother of two who likes to think she's well informed, um, who's beyond that is someone that is, a, I guess, an advocate or a translator, um, someone who's constantly uh, trying to navigate bureaucracy so that my family are able to partake in in the forms that they receive at work and income, for, for example. So for me, when I think of the first time that I came uh, in contact with the system, especially um, was, like you said, at the age of five, it was in the moment of walking into WINS at the time, which is MSD, I learned that um, me being able to translate how food supplements were, how the food grant work and how accommodation supplement work would be the determining factor for my mother who didn't speak very good English um, and the determining factor of whether we ate that night. And so um, I think I also realized at the age of 11 that I had to find ways in which I can translate the I guess the heaviness of health and medical words uh, into Tongan words so that my mom is able to advocate for the needs that we needed in health, but also be able to advocate that we're not in any danger. Um, and as we know, the health system has had its, you know, ups and downs and still today we see it. 
Um, and so that is something I'm still having to do to do today. And just in fact, today I got a call from my mum saying she went in to get support around uh, her arthritis and all they focused on was the weight that she had gained since the last time they seen her. And, and at that point, you know, having to tell my mum that, you know, that she doesn't have to worry and that her needs are, need, are, more, are important, you know, you, you immediately feel like you question why you're in these positions of privilege when um, you're a part of a system that you're trying to help your family navigate, but also change. And so as you see these tears, it is a bit of frustration, but also uh, the different hats you have to wear. And I think what I'm trying to get across is, is how do we change that and do better so that young people today do not have to experience what I go through. And it's unfortunate that it's still what's happening today. Um, and so, you know, as, as I, um, as I sit here, I often wonder if, um, you know, the things that we do do is, is, is really going to make that change. And, I, and I'm hopeful. I really am hopeful. And I don't want to, to um, disregard any work that people do in the system and outside of the system. But I think it's really important to realize that in amongst the work that we do and the fight and change that we try to bring alongside that, people are still trying to access these supports and still trying to navigate and figure out how they have to arm themselves and be resilient all the time just to get help. And so um, I guess a perspective I want to bring to this corridor is the importance of, you know, asking ourselves that, you know, whether what we're doing is bigger than ourselves and then whether what we're doing is actually the best that we can do. And so um, there will be no uh, academic research coming from my mouth today. I can guarantee you that. But if anything, I'm happy to be vulnerable in this space, uh, give perspective, but also uplift the voices of the communities that I'm really fortunate uh, to, to represent and also advocate for. Um, and so I hope and I do pray that one day, um, you know, we don't replicate the system that has become the status quo. And so if I think of inequality, I think of our students today who are currently uh, living off the bare minimum from their student allowances, who come to me to my office and say, if I don't meet my rent, I'm going to drop out. And these are third year students, Maori and Pacific students who have to send money back home or who have to uh, find a side hustle that we know isn't safe just to get by. And it's like in 2022, that is still the reality of the discussions that I'm having to say to students that, you know, there are supports out there when you know yourself that you struggle to access them. And so um, what are we doing? What I want to leave here as I finish is um, do we really want uh, young people in the future, in future, future leaders uh, in our country to have to constantly talk about resilience and, you know, uh, applaud people for being resilient or do we want to find a way in which our system means that they don't have to wear that all the time? So that's all I want to say. Thank oh, you. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Melissa. You you touched on a number of things. And, and yesterday while we were talking, you had us all in tears. Yeah. So, it's personal, isn't it? Very. <laughs> very important. It's very, it's, it's, it's our own whānau we're, yeah. we're dealing with. What gives you hope? Um. Actually, what gives me hope, but also makes me sad, something I said to Shane, is that my family's hope at the moment is me becoming, having a doctorate. Mm. And so mm. as much as it's like, what? That's what your family's hope is. If that's what I can do to give them hope in their lives right now, then I will, I will do that. And so um, at the same time, I have a mother who raised children on her own, uh, who works all these hours to help me get through my study um, tell me that in amongst opportunities that I have, you know, you've always got to carry people with you. And so that's my hope um, today. Yeah. Yeah, well, Marlo, yeah. Marlo, thank you for, for sharing. One thing, one yeah. word that Melissa used, and, and I'd like everyone out there to, to think about, Melissa used the word privilege. Right? Privilege, think about that. Moving along, Professor Ritchie, over to you. Thank you, esteemed chair. Um, and for the introduction, thank you as well. Um, I should correct and say I formerly was um, oh, chief you. science advisor to Ministry of Social Development and it's um, now the role job of a uh, spectacular person, Professor Tracy McIntosh. Uh, Melissa's um, kōrero 
is um, it's compelling uh, because it's authentic. It's not wrapped up in weasel words, heroic speak, or any captured by any form of sophistry, which is, I think, what drives most of us nuts, especially those that have been working in this area, trying to um, lean into it and do something helpful for, in my case, over a quarter of a century. Uh, but I'm going to give you a, a very quick overview of um, a moderately hopeful scenario. And I'm speaking more directly to researchers than to any other group, because the story starts with research. And in particular research we did in the early 2000s from the Dunedin study that showed that if you are born into socioeconomic disadvantage and remain there for the whole of your childhood, and by that I'm talking about up to the age of 15 years, um, the long-term consequences for physical health and mental well-being are, are potent uh, and detrimental. And interestingly, up until that point, no one had conclusively shown um, whether if you grow out of poverty into the upper echelons of the socioeconomic spectrum by adulthood, whether that would undo or mitigate the initial and early impact of childhood poverty. So this paper that we, we published in 2002 did exactly that and showed unequivocally that what happens in childhood has long lasting echoes down through the life force and the echoes are all adverse. I mean, poverty is a classic distal as opposed to proximal or near risk factor for a whole range of bad outcomes. Uh, this initial paper was part of the reason I, along with my um, colleague and friend, Philip Howden Chapman, were asked to be part of a group. And I brought this along because I had to read it the other day to remember what was in it. <laughs> um, a Russell Wills mm. instigated a report on solutions to child poverty in New Zealand, evidence for action. No longer evidence for talking, 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 mm -hmm. and nice reports, evidence for action. Now, if you look at this, you can see that the first three points of 78 takeaway messages bear a, quite a resemblance to the content of the uh, Child Poverty Reduction Act. In fact, the then opposition member in a private member's bill, I believe, Jacinda Ardern, um, took from this report a collective effort, um, much of the core message related to how one could tackle this wicked problem. Wicked is now, I think, the code for don't go there because it's too tough. Now, this was an interesting moment in time where the research was, was brought together. Um, a minister from the opposition thought, I like the look of that. Um, and it led subsequently, once whilst Labour were in power, to some significant legislative change um, and also fed into the production of the Child and Youth Wellbeing Report. So you saw a relationship. It's never linear, by the way. Research doesn't come out and all of a sudden the government changes because politics always trumps research. But what we saw was a, um, a flow of information through different um, parts of society to the stage where it ended up being discussed in our parliament and ended up being debated um, and uh, getting cross-party support for the key initiatives that have flowed from this um, early work such that poverty has to be reported on by different ways every year. And there are three-year targets and there's a 10-year or nine-year target. So far, the data suggests that things are moving in the right direction. Uh, not fast enough though, never is fast enough. Every day a child spends in poverty is a bad day. Mm -hmm. It's unconscionable that we sit around <laughs> waiting for things to happen. And I think there's enormous frustration because these gaps or inequalities have been there forever it seems. And we know the rationale and the story behind it. We now need to grip it up as they say in um, uh, officials land in Wellington and shake it so we can make some real changes. Remember that the set evidence for action. Best efforts are being made by many, and I cast no aspersions on all those efforts, but it has to be ratcheted up because we still have scandalous high rates of child poverty. We cannot sit by and tolerate that. That's not for someone else to take care of. We all need to chip in. 
Um, and this we do, excuse me, <clears throat> things will not manifestly change. That, I guess, is my bottom line. We can, through research and other things, get to, get to a certain point, but it needs to go much further. And I know my uh, colleagues on the panel are going to talk about what that might look like. So thank you for listening, and I look forward to further discussion after our presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Richie. You, you mentioned 25 years ago. I was thinking 25 years ago, my parents were alive. Now I'm here. 25 years into the future, my grandchildren will be in their 40s. And I'm left with a question. Is inequality intergenerational now? Yes, and that's the double whammy, of course. Mm. Um, so if you grow up in poverty, you learn the rules about poverty, which is don't expect too much. Um, and that maybe you're not as good as someone else and you don't have the resources to uh, access opportunity to improve yourself. And that becomes um, uh, part of the family history and understanding of how the world works. And if I was in that boat, um, I'd be pretty pissed off mm. uh, and I'd be pretty angry. And so the people that uh, are in that situation currently have every right to voice their displeasure mm. and disappointment. Uh, and they should not be marginalized in terms of political ideology of, as being, if they're on um, benefits, as being lazy. They're not. Mm. They want to get out there and participate in society. Mm. And sadly, and I suppose this will be touched on for sure uh, by Shane and others, it's not an equal playing field. So proportionally, more Māori and Pacifica are enduring poverty and all its unpleasantness than Pākehā. Mm. And that hasn't changed either. Yet we've recognized that discrepancy for 30 plus years as well. So there's a number of um, real challenges that we are moving in the right direction about, but we need to speed it up. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Sure. Was, it ever, was it ever discussed about having a treaty clause in the Poverty Reduction Act? It was discussed, but it wasn't discussed as it is discussed today. I think that the good news in the last 10 years, the Tariti is now talked about um, with insight and understanding of the implications of what went on before and what that tells us about where we should go and how we should go forward. 10 years ago, Philippa, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we understood that this was important. The uh, ethos or the, the, the values that sat behind that treaty are essential for the uh, future of Aotearoa and New Zealand, um, but it wouldn't, I don't think it, um, had it as front and centre as you would see now in most documents. Mm -hmm. Is that about hey, right? This is mm -hmm. really, really great. You know, this is unscripted conversation that's, that's happening. <laughs> yeah. hey, thank you, Richie. Sure is it privilege intergenerational. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to what you have to say, Helen. Sure, Tato. Thank you so much, Wayne. So my research focuses on the gap between CEO and worker pay levels, and I now have more than 20 years of data. And what we see from that is this growing gap between people who are very highly paid and the lower paid workers in the organisation measured by mean and uh, by median uh, using the household labour force uh, survey data. And that data is quite generous. It's um, estimated that in 2022, an individual was getting uh, $35 per hour at the mean level and $30 per hour at the median level. So if we think of that relative to the minimum wage at the moment in New Zealand, which is 2120, if I was to make my ratios relative to the minimum wage, they would be even larger than they are. So at the mean level, it suggests median pay levels in New Zealand relative to CEOs on listed companies sit between 15 and 18 times. So those individuals at the highest level of the organisation are earning considerably more and that's grown by 243% over that time period relative to income to workers that's only grown at about 100%. So we're talking about significant changes in pay over time growing at much higher rates. If I think about living on minimum income, 2120 an hour is $848 a week, that's pre-tax. So even if we don't take the tax off or adjust for KiwiSaver, paying rent, paying electricity, buying food, if you've got school-aged children, having enough money to buy petrol or to buy a bus ticket to get your children to school every day, it's really, really hard. And that doesn't include clothing or additional costs that might come through medical uncertainty or potentially a car failure which might drive someone to have to borrow at high cost of borrowing because they can't borrow money directly from the bank. So it's a very difficult cycle to break. 
in addition, our research shows that it doesn't stop when you retire. Some people think when you get the pension, life potentially will be easier. That has an adequacy rate measured through the OECD of approximately 40%, which means you're achieving 40% of what you would have achieved while working. And often people retire with debt, still paying mortgages, or find now that they have to work much longer after the 65-year-old retirement age in New Zealand. So all of these are contributing uh, severely to child poverty because these households are impacted daily uh, through the income that comes from those individuals working at home and trying to make ends meet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I picked up from what you were saying, breaking the cycles of inequality. One minute. If you were the Minister of Finance, mm -hmm. how would you break those cycles of inequality? Thank you, Wayne. So I think it's really, really important that we look at what's happening in our low decile schools. I think one way to address this poverty cycle is to have children going to school and staying at school until year 13 with the option of going into tertiary or additional training so that they end up having the opportunity of choice where they work, what they do, and earning enough money that they aren't living constantly in poverty. When you have choice, you have dignity. Mm. Kia ora. Thank you, Alan. So privilege, intergenerational cycles of inequality. Over to you, Shane. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, Wayne, te nga koe oho. Nga koe. Yeah, um, kai karakia, no Ngāti Kahanunu, te nga koe oho. Um, esteemed colleagues and and friends who have turned up for this conversation. Um, my connection to the kaupapa of inequality really goes back to my wife and I, and actually she should be sitting here mm. because, because she has far more of a claim to the hard yards that were done when we did this mahi. But we fostered and whangai 192 young people over 12 years. Wow. And mm. one of the disturbing things and it was often, often, you know, people would immediately say, you know, the parents, um, they'd use this term kind of bad parents and all that kind of thing. But often young people were coming to us because of um, really neglect and deprivation. And one of the things that we quickly came to was, was um, <clears throat> not to think of parents badly because we had their children in care and to really work hard about thinking about them differently because socially they were already mistreated badly. And, you know, when Pu Te Atatū came out, the report on the Department of Social Welfare that challenged its racism and the subsequent 1989 CYPNF Act, the numbers of Māori children that were in care dropped to the lowest numbers they've ever been. <laughs> in the following three years. But quickly after that, um, what I saw as an in insidious evil started to take over um, the public sector. And, and whatever department you were in, you started to get the same kind of chief executives with the same kind of imperatives. And and I remember the first time I heard a government department called a business or a company. And at the time I let it slide. But today, if I hear it, I let people know that they're not a business, that actually they're a public service that I, I pay taxes for and I want the best for young people. And one of the things that's very clear from the research of the likes of my colleague, Emily Cadell, Mm -hmm. and the research that her and Len Cook put in at the Waitangi Tribunal Inquiry into Oranga Tamariki last year was the clear links between deprivation, ethnicity, and intervention by the state. Now, you can repeat those same stats in a number of other places. And I couldn't believe that, you know, kind of 30 years later, we're making the same mistake again. And so when I started to look at the numbers of Māori children who were in care, it became very clear to me that based on a, a safety risk approach, they were 
removing children, and I'll, I'll use this term badly in, in, in a clumsy way, but I mean to, to try and fix them in a whole number of different ways. And, and we had record numbers of Māori children in care. And the problem was they are coming back home to a home near you. They come back to our communities. And it was as if those, those tamariki or those rangatahi were the primary client of a number of organisations and their whānau were the secondary client. In other words, they were an appendage. In other words, they were saying, we can't afford to work with the parents or anyone else. We'll just concentrate our money, our putia, on this individual. Hence, record numbers of children in care, but also rampant approaches to safety and risk. And <clears throat> I, I, my analogy for this is something you'd see at the end of a, um, a mafia movie. And it's not a very nice one, but I think, and I really believe this about the public service, um, that in a number of places, several different ministries and several different pieces of legislation, they need a, um, a Treaty of Waitangi Clause that includes things like the mana of all of our children, not just Māori, you know, but the Public Finance Act should have that in it. The Poverty Reduction Act should have a treaty clause in it. And I have a whole number of other acts where I think we should have it as well. Um, because if, you're, if we're going to continue to think that the corporatization of the public sector is a good idea, then all we're saying to poor people and those who, who suffer the disempowerment and the daily pain that goes with this, all we're saying to them is um, it's nothing personal, it's just business. And I'm sick of thinking like that, and I want to work with people who think differently. And probably what really sparked me up was during COVID, especially when I saw the Kopapa Māori NGOs and uh, the iwi ropu like Takaika and NGOs like Tahawara, during COVID, they, they just went nuts. They risked their own health. They got right in amongst whānau. If you go to the facilities of both of those organisations now, their workers, when they go to homes, they take kai. There was a hall there where we used to play basketball. It's full of kai because this is how they're dealing with poverty. Now, the fact that they're doing something about it is good, but it's still not dealing with the structural cause of it. 30,000 empty homes in Auckland as a, you know, as a, as a consequence of the white line test and a number of other things. Um, I kind of think, how can we have 30,000 empty homes when children in Fano are sleeping in cars? Mm -hmm. We're not that kind of Aotearoa New Zealand. Rents, Porirua, $700 a week for a three-bedroom home. Mm -hmm. How do we let that happen? A duopoly controlling supermarkets. You know, supermarket staff are wanting to wear body cams. Mm -hmm. And everyone is thinking that's because it's COVID. I think it's because people are sick and tired of what they have to leave in that shop and what they can't afford to take home. Because mm. when I go shopping now, and I have a huge capacity in terms of what I, what I can purchase in a shop, but I cannot imagine what it is like for a mother with a child mm. who has to leave things they need. It's not personal. It's just business. Thank you. Yeah, what a shame. Wow, that, that, you, <coughs> you packed a lot into that. Uh, 190 plus children you, you, you and your wife have, have brought up over the years. And, and, and reading all your bios, it shows to me that you all have life experience when it comes to this. And there's no substitute for life experience. And Shane, you mentioned the Treaty of Waitangi. Is co-governance the answer or well, an answer? I, look, I, um, I, I think it is. I think if we're going to have an honest conversation in dealing with housing and dealing with employment 
in dealing with income, um, it starts on the basis of Te Tuti or Waitangi. Um, the, the Health Authority is the first cab off the rank. I think there is opportunity for a number of others, especially as we are capacity building in other sectors. I'd like to point out Te Tuti or Waitangi invites everyone who is in Aotearoa onto this soil mm. and says, be part of our whenua. And rather than seeing it as being divisive or threatening, I think it is one of the unique things that divides us worldwide. When, when my daughter went to live in Germany, I was worried that I would lose her heart to being European and that I would never get her back to Aotearoa. But one of the things that really amazed me was the things that her friends in Germany wanted to know about being Māori. And so she came home from Germany utterly convinced about her place in Aotearoa, but also what she had to contribute to this country being Māori. And I think for me, that's part of, I think, our overall response and let's talk about inequality. Um, when we go to the ballot box, you know, I don't want to vote for the same old rubbish. I'm sick of it. I'm, I'm sick of human beings being turned into cost centres. You know, when, when a, a child turns up at Oranga Tamariki, it shouldn't be an issue of what this could cost because good child protection work is costly. It's not cheap. Building relationships costs money. You have to work hard at it. And so a broad question I would ask across all of these ministries is how do we uphold the mana of all children? And I think the treaty is a good starting point for that conversation. Kia ora, so privileged. And I'll shut up because <laughs> Philip has got to get going. <laughs> so we've heard, heard privilege, intergenerational cycles, the treaty of Waitangi. Whoop! Up for this discussion tonight, and I'm so looking forward to what you have to say, Philippa. Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa, Namihiki to Kopapa, Tenera, Tenepo. So it is a, it's a real pleasure to be with you all. I've been writing, I took action from your uh, uh, speak, Richie. Um, uh, you're the, the translator, Melissa, and I'm a translator in a different way. You're ability to move between a whole lot of people. Um, you're one about stressing the growth and inequalities in terms of income. Mm -hmm. And and when you're kind of um, the breadth and the the, the spongai that you're doing and the and the, the recognition of the system and how we've got to improve that and the central place of Tetriti. So I'm going to pick up some of that, um, particularly in relation to housing. Um, because having a home is a central aspect of people's oh. lives and, and the cornerstone basically of trust in society and its institutions. You can't, you don't trust people. Um, on, on, on where I walk to work at Scott, excuse the language, it says, um, uh, what should I do for anyone? What the fuck has anyone ever done for me? You know, so if people feel like that, excuse the mm. language, um, then nice they're not going to be kind of actually... Um, contributing. So I think a safe, warm, secure, affordable house in a community that's inclusive um, is central to people's health and well-being. But I want to briefly talk about the problem first, which we're very familiar with because housing is the issue, I think, for the election mm. and for our society. Um, sadly, since 1991, the rates of ownership have really declined and there are some shocking ethnic inequalities. So in, in 2018, when the last census was, um, two th only two thirds of um, New Zealanders are, are lived in a home that they owned. Um, it's higher proportion for Pakeha, it's 70%. It's under half for Māori and it's even lower, it's low 30s for Pacifica. So that means that some people are secure in their housing and some people aren't. So that's the structural um, mm. insecurity and uh, we, we've just, when my colleagues finished 
um, um, a, a, well, partway through a project on, on eviction and how destabilizing that is for families having to move out of community and children moving around. And the more times that they move, one of um, very good doctorate done by Kim Nathan, the more likely they are um, to have behavioral and social problems. So we found um, that too. Sure. Um, there are now 27,000 people on the Ministry of Social Development waiting list. So it's been going up like this, just slowed very recently. That's 27,000 people who can't afford private rental and are living in cars or crowding with relatives. I've worked with colleagues um, on a severe housing deprivation and found that there are close to 4,000 people who are not in shelter, so they're in traditional sense homeless. Um, about 8,000 people were in temporary accommodation, the emergency housing, the, the, the motels. Um, 30,000 people were in severely crowded houses. And we know from, if you can't afford um, the rent, the way to make it a bit cheaper is get more people into the house. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an economic um, choice and most of the time, not a, not a cultural um, choice because everybody likes privacy and being able to talk to people with lots of other people around. And we did a study looking at things that you need in your house like electricity, there are 60,000 households who are either um, in severe deprivation, either lacking electricity, potable water, um, shocking figures, and particularly in rural areas. So the problem, there's too many people living in poor quality houses in New Zealand. Sure there are too few houses. So according to Kiwi Bank, actually, they've been recently, the, the, the position is, is um, improving. And the, 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 a year ago, it was 57,000 houses short. Now we think there's about 23,000 houses short. And this is due to the building um, in the private sector about and, and kāinga ora, which I have the privilege, as pointed to um, by the government. Um, so I'm part of this largest building exercise that's been since the after the Second World War. And the idea is to get more affordable homes, both to rent and to buy, and secure ones, not when you're ki when you're kicked out. So um, I'll briefly talk just about um, uh, uh, the research group that I set up with my colleagues. Uh, that's He Kainga Oranga, uh, the Housing and Health Research Program. And we decided we weren't just going to describe inequality and how it was growing. We were going to look at the things that would make a difference. So we did very robust studies about retrofitting, insulation to houses, ventilations, heating, um, stopping um, injuries where people fall in their houses, making it easier for disabled people to get into their houses. And this is linked to the WHI Cheddar Committee that worked out the uh, housing and health guidelines and we're now linked to, through to the WHO. And we know that that makes a big difference to oh. the number of hospitalizations there, how children do mm. at school, how many days they miss off school. Mm. And my colleague, um, um, Professor Neville Pierce, has been doing that, um, actually monetizing all those um, differences. So um, the worst thing, of course, is private rental housing in New Zealand. And um, there's um, 30,000 empty homes are mm. basically because whoever owns them is waiting around for capital gains and they don't care about the rent. In fact, rent in wealthy areas is usually cheaper than in poorer areas because it's the, it's not the rent that's going to make them wealthy. It's going to be the capital gains. So we we did a lot of work. We did a set up a rental warrant of fitness, which um, uh, paved the way for the healthy home standards. And I guess that's the thing I feel proudest about really. So if you're in a flat um, in, in, in Dunedin, um, that basically by the middle of next year, whether the university owns it, um, Kangora owns it, the local community, the Presbyterian Church, they have to have, it has to have high level of insulation, it has to have ventilation, and it has to have heating so that it can be heated to 18 degrees. So that's a big change um, mm. from um, flats that some people sure crashed. Um, and in Kaiangora that, um, and to pick up your translator, I was given the opportunity to 
take those research results, which after all were paid by the taxpayers, the work that we did, and actually say, this is how it can make the houses better. And that's very, very exciting. So that's linking together. Um, oh, I must stop. I'm going my button. No, I keep going. <laughs> <laughs> it links, the links between the university mm -hmm. and the bodies like mm -hmm. Hekang or Ora, which is homes and communities. And that's been set up, not one of those business-making places. I mean, we have to be... <laughs> Fly. I mean, we, we, we have to make sure that everything adds up over a long period, but we've been giving, given funding to raise bonds, um, well-being green bonds, so they have enough money to keep it going so there's not a boom and bust. Oh. And um, this year we've built um, 1,800 houses, and there's, um, since Kainga Oro was set up in, in 2019, we've sold five and a half thousand houses. So it's a very, very exciting because there are 68,000 of those homes. We, we house about mm. 380,000 um, people. And so your, your point about was is very similar where people grumble if they feel that somebody's misbehaving next door. But the idea is that we help people to sustain tenancies in the communities, mm. which we give lots of resources to make sure there's parks there, increasingly mm -hmm. cycleways and walkways. So it's a very exciting space for me to be in. And um, so I think things are difficult mm -hmm. and I really, really um, realize that they're much more difficult um, for Māori and Pacifica, but things are definitely changing and for the better. And I'm personally working with Kangora, with a helping to build Papakainga mm -hmm. housing in Wanui and Mata. And that's on a Marae Reserve land and it's like very exciting and it's a co-governance oh. thing with the with the actually in this case an urban authority. It's very exciting. So I'm fizzing with it all. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you. Can I I said it an Iwi based construction company that only yeah. had to have an ROI of 3%. Yeah. Imagine what they could do to the market. Yeah, the Murray, <laughs> Murray, Murray companies are prioritised in Kaingora and apprenticeships mm. and stuff like that. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I said at the very beginning that we've got an awesome panel and we have some of the country's best thinkers on our panel tonight. And I think they've just proven us. I'm going to say to the panel, thank you very much. Grab a drink of water, have a one-minute break. <laughs> We've got questions coming in, and we're going to start engaging with our audience and the questions they they have to are uh, uh, are asking. And this first question we are not going to take because it says, "Should Ian Foster still be the coach of the All Blacks?" <laughs> well, wrong, wrong one, guys. Hey, go go to Sky TV now. Okay. So they lose it. Because <laughs> we all know the answer to that. The answer is bring back Buck. Okay. <laughs> so our first question, and I'm going to pose this to the whole panel. If anybody would like to uh, answer this question, how can we persuade the top ten percent of New Zealanders who? own nearly 60% of New Zealand's wealth to filter or distribute that wealth to the bottom 50% who own only 2% of New Zealand's wealth. Would anybody like to give that one a go? I'll open by saying... Okay, thank I've, you, Shane. I've come across some amazing philanthropy mm -hmm. from um, different sectors. And I'm the chair of Voice Whakarunga Mai and the... Um, the larger organisations and individuals that support um, that mahi are magnificent. But that's by relationship, and it's one relationship at a time. And for me, the movement of wealth to that group has been significant in the last 20 years. And I think about how we can move it back. I don't think we can rely on the market to mitigate this, um, I do think we have to use some levers mm. in our country, but also appeal to those people on the basis of, and I've decided to call the market um, those who have capital, and I think about it now as being people, and, uh, and also this kind of mantra that we've almost got from it, that greed is good. Well, it's not, you know, the things that it's doing in our nation. And I don't think the 10% that own 60% of Aotearoa want to leave a legacy of greed. I think they want to leave a legacy 
of building a better country, that their mark on this country would be for those things. <laughs> Anybody else want to give that? Oh, to I'm, I'm happy to go. Okay. Um, okay. And I'll probably say something a little weird for some appointed headed academic like me. Um, but a really obvious thing to do is to introduce a capital gains tax. Now, this is a political football, mm. but... Um, a proper one. A proper, proper one. hard one. Proper one. <laughs> this, yeah, soft <laughs> With no form, escape thing. So, <laughs> soft forms of it. And but the, the bottom line on that is it's not the politicians that are at fault. They make the decision. So in that sense, they are. But what they're trying to... The politics of New Zealand is, is the middle, politics of the middle ground. And because it's politically unacceptable, so no political parties prepared to go down that path. Um, the middle ground has to set, has to agree upon, set up some new rules and all lean into it and let politicians know. So it becomes something that goes back onto the table. Uh, and it's not a radical proposition. Most every other jurisdiction like similar to New Zealand, um, it's a no brainer. Yet we're this outlier. Uh, and of course, some of this distortion um, of the um, money distribution, um, maybe a lot of it is driven by this idea that you invest in bricks and mortar. Um, and that's how wealth grows, forget income, how wealth grows. And that's, uh, what's the guy's name? Akiti. Yeah. Um, he, his book basically said for most of human history, that's been the way. It's been an you know, aberration point in the first part of the last century, but we're now going back to that. Well, you don't, you should not let those forces overrun you we can push back and there are simple levers that can be pulled that will have an effect it won't solve the, solve the problem overnight i mean that's naive but it will make a difference um so why are we holding back on that mm -hmm. Here's a question that I agree. Um, can I just, can, can okay. I just, yeah. just, just on that, I mean, I agree about a wealth tax. And Piketty says actually that most investment all around the world, because there's been housing bubbles in most of the Western countries, has been in buildings, not in land anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's the largest asset people own. And somebody talked about the intergenerational stuff. That's why the privilege gets passed along. Mm -hmm. Your grandparents and your parents haven't owned a house. You are not going to have enough money to buy a house. So I think the wealth tax is very important. And Piketty in his book, The Capital, really makes the point that unless the government intervenes, there might be very good people doing charity, but it's a drop in the bucket, really, mm. compared mm. to what is needed. Absolutely. Mm. And exactly. So the way that question was posed was interesting. How do we persuade? Yeah. Well, you don't. Yeah. You don't persuade. That requires goodwill and, and mm. uh, motivation from both sides. You make it a requirement. Yeah. That's what legislation is for. But and it's for the greater there, good. Isn't there an argument that says that there's too much government in our lives? Well, whose argument? Yeah, who's saying that? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry, but the people who are not in government at the moment that, yes. back that argument generally have capital, mm, yeah, because um, they don't want to redistribute it. And your and your point that you made before about thirty thousand what they call ghost houses, nobody in them. And mm, like, mm. if we were in Barcelona or in Spain, they tax them and they do also mm. in England too, because you provide these sort of deserts, mm -hmm. you know, as, a, as with an island, all these a big boom in houses and they're all empty and then they're vandalised. And mm. so I think we should, you know, we could get some good examples from other parts in the OEDC mm. and tax people who choose to leave their houses empty for a, mm. a huge amount of time. I'm going to pose this question to Helen. Mm -hmm. Are there any countries we can look mm -hmm. to and learn from as good examples of doing things right to solve some of these problems? Mm, and certainly there are. Uh, if you look in the, the practice around the Scandinavian countries, Norway and Sweden, actually, Shane and I were talking about this the other day, you know, good health care, good social systems in place to ensure that people have good places to live, safe, clean, warm places to live, number one priority, food to eat on a regular basis, are forms of employment that give them adequate income to live. Not large levels of income necessarily, but a, certainly a social system that looks after everybody equally. So you don't see these huge divides between people who are really, really struggling and those who are just making ends meet. And can I just find the, the, the issue of debt, which plagues, mm -hmm. you know, it's one mm -hmm. reason why people can't get into a house because they've got debt, they can't start paying a mortgage. But if you're in Finland and you give a speeding fine, mm -hmm. it's 10 times yeah. the amount of money and the, and the 
the cop looks up on his thing, he can see what your wow. your um, salary is. And if you're a multimillionaire, you pay hundreds of thousands in a fine. Yeah, I think the record in Finland is 200,000. Yes. A guy got a speeding ticket for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I got that amount the other day. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, quite often a question like this, what can we learn from other countries? We immediately run off to Europe and we mm. totally ignore the Pacific. Mm. What can we learn from the Pacific? I definitely think what we can learn from the Pacific is, um, for me, I totally think it's uh, wrapping ourselves around Tao Māori and Tikanga Māori because in the Pacific, like Samoa, they do have a Matai system alongside the government system. And not that I'm saying that there has been a way, mm. but what I'm saying is there is a central point in which we base our practices, our values, regardless of your cultural, religious background. There is a certain point in which we come together and we sort of base the way in which we interact and if anything, there's this massive, uh, massive, but there's a big emphasis on when you make a decision, you think about how it affects you, the person next to you, the people around you, and then you think about who's left out in that conversation and then who is going to, um, you know, what are the consequences of those who weren't a part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that doesn't happen here, but in terms of normalizing that type of thinking and mentality, I think is something that we could look to for the Pacific and not to say, you know, studying my doctorate in the Pacific region, we've got some things we need to work on, mm -hmm. but <laughs> that is definitely some of the values that I think we could. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, can I add something yeah, to that? Um, mm -hmm. I'm not anti-business or anti-capitalism in any way, shape or form. Um, I'm, I'm kaitahu and I would consider us to be one of the Which is best really collective capitalists, <laughs> corporates in the country. And we are, but the benefits are for a broad group of people. The benefits of the investments that that tribe makes comes back to 33 or 34,000 people. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I guess what I'm after, when you start to, to look at these issues, uh, is more distributive justice. Because for me, when I think about child protection and the fact that poor people generally add on being Māori or Pacifica, and you're six times more likely to end up with a child in care or to come to notice or um, or 18 times more likely in the worst deprivation deciles to um, have abuse substantiated. When you put those things together, um, we have to start dealing with those kind of things that are viewed as wicked problems, as Richie has said, in far broader ways. And so, you know, when when if you get it down to a practice level, when a social worker or a teacher or any other human service worker is there and they're having to deal with kind of the behavior behavioral issues of a child or an adult, um, you can't you can't disregard housing. <laughs> You can't disregard food. Right. You can't disregard energy. You can't disregard clothes. Mm -hmm. They are all parts of the way that we feel fully human. And so mm -hmm. I, um, I've i been lucky enough to be teaching up in Norway since 2007. And I love teaching up there. And I have a whānau up there that that just such a wonderful place to be. But one of the and like other parts of Scandinavia, they operate on the basis that in in um, companies and in some government departments, the CE can't earn more than 10 times what the, the lowest paid worker earns. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I just like think, Japan too is like that. you know, like a country that thinks like that, I think is a fairer country. And I think by nature, um, the people of Aotearoa, we think we like to give people a fair go. Mm -hmm. But if we really look at it honestly at the moment, we're not giving the poor a fair go. And we're not giving particular sections of society a fair go. Mm -hmm. And we have to have, you know, honest and robust conversations about it. Great, great answer. You know, individual wealth versus collective wealth. Yeah. Right. Now, I'm going to pose this question to you, to you which was it's about issues and recommendations and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Hey, great question.
questions people keep them rolling in. Why is it that groups are formed to help solve these issues? Recommendations are made, but those recommendations are never really, they're, they're never made a reality. Where does the issue lie? Richie, say what Richie. you said yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm posing the question. <laughs> say what you said. Um, do you remember what you said yesterday about this? About implementation. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I was going to go there. <laughs> oh, God. What did I say yesterday? Um, yeah, so, and this is often the case. Uh, you can have great research, great policy developed from research, uh, and then basically there's a failure to implement mm -hmm. properly. So, more often, what you see in in um, the public service is poor ideas implemented halfway okay, win the day over great ideas that are poorly implemented. So the implementation is the is the uh, is the mysterious black box of social policy. Why can't we take these good ideas and roll them out and make them stick in real people's lives? There's a whole bunch of um, answers probably none of which is uh, um sufficient unto itself but you've got the um the bizarrely siloed uh, um ministerial set up where every silo is incentivized to do well against its other silos when the best approach is honestly cross-sectoral mm -hmm. um, and that's been known and obvious for a long time mm -hmm. but when i was a science advisor i asked everyone i met including ministers after about a year in the job, could they point me in the direction of a single example of cross-sectoral cooperation that was sustainable? Not it was set up and ran for a bit, but was sustainable, because that's the way we need to, to go. And I'm still waiting for an answer. Mm. There's no examples of the success. So what is that about? What's the perverse incentivization of people in their silos to hit their KPIs, to grab as much resource rather than share? Uh, and that, you know that's a core challenge, and we need to have an honest, more honest, open discussion about how that works. We need to have public servants who call out these perverse incentives and speak to the government of the day in a without fear of favour approach. Now, apparently, that was de rigueur when I was knee high to a grasshopper thirty or forty years ago. That was the way things happened in New Zealand, but somehow there's been a politicisation and a dampening or a dilution of the public service without fear or favor approach such that um, it's become highly politicized and that needs to be turned back. Uh -huh. You need to rip the scab off that. Mm -hmm. And to have those conversations is very hard because people mm -hmm. who are in the seats right now don't particularly like engaging in those conversations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know I'm, I'm an optimist by nature. <laughs> <laughs> we and all I, are here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, but I, I do think in housing, it got to such a terrible state. And the, mm -hmm. the, 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 when we moved to, say, selling off houses, the affordable houses, to private um, landlords mm -hmm. um, who didn't have to do them up or anything, I think we've moved back to saying, and it's not just our research, there's quite a number of people who are doing it. These, this is the kind of things that you should be doing. They're set out clearly. We work with ACC because their injuries occur in the home. We work with the councils because they're yeah. trying to um, make sure that the city doesn't spread out. So we were thinking about trying to um, make cities that are more resilient for the kind of climate change events that we're going to get. We're thinking about where schooling is. It's no use building oh. where there aren't um, oh. schools. And and the most exciting thing that's happening at the moment, which I think is the advantage that we have as a small society, is that um, the chair of um, Pangoro is um, Bui Mark Goshi, and he's also had roles in the health service. Mm. And he knows that basically people get stuck in hospital because there's nowhere for them to go outside. People get stuck in prisons for bail or remand because there's nowhere for them to go. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, that we have to start joining up and we have sustaining tenancies and supporting tenancies for people and those kind of conditions. It's complicated. Um, obviously, people have very complex lives and mm -hmm. not everybody would choose some people as neighbours, but there are, you know, 300,000 tenants and just a very few of them who are kind of um, in trouble. So I, I do think housing is a very good example at the moment. That's good. Mm -hmm. to, and to hear in those communities, mm -hmm. we all need love. 
Yeah. We all need someone to smile at us. <laughs> yeah. Like, like yesterday I was, um, I, I, we'd had our hui for this and I was at New World. And as I walked into New World, there was a young fella sitting on the ground playing a guitar mm -hmm. for some monies. And um, I got my groceries, came out, put it in the car and then headed back to say hello to the young fella and put some money in his thing. And um, and I could just see see the looks from people that were saying, mm -hmm. don't encourage him. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, and, and, and but anyway. He was playing the guitar. He was playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care if he's clapping, <laughs> singing out a tune or whatever. Mm -hmm. He was doing something. And anyway, put the monies in his thing. And, and then I looked at him and I said, I think I know you, bro. Mm -hmm. And then he said, Shane Walker, I know you. <laughs> and, and and so in answer to the question, the best way that the average citizen can contribute meaningfully to addressing the issues of inequality, it starts in our neighbourhoods, mm -hmm. in the places where we shop, and in the care we have for those who have less than us mm -hmm. or whose behaviour um, might show that they're not being cared for um, properly. It starts with our compassion. It starts with the way that if someone is standing in the middle of the road trying to direct traffic with a bottle in one hand and hitting cars in the other, we don't stand on either side of the sidewalk and laugh. You know, we get the right people there straight away and we try and get that person off the road. So I don't think it's just up to those who have political influence. I think this kind of movement is ground up where, and again, during COVID, we've seen what Kiwis are capable of, but also during COVID, mm -hmm. we saw how quickly the government could move to spend $45 billion. Mm -hmm. Now, why can't we deal with poverty when we're only a country of, you know, the size we are? <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I know that person actually because I remember the person at New World playing the guitar, yeah, yeah. singing, and I stopped putting money in, in his in his suitcase there, and he actually stopped singing and said thank you. Yeah, yeah. Amazing kindness can go a long way. Question okay. for Helen: mm. Is the concept of universal basic income worth considering? I I think it is, and I mean my data already relies on you know information about mean and median income levels and looking at where they are relative to higher income levels so setting a basic income worth consideration I think it is but people are worth more than that and I think firms have to start thinking about how do you value your employees you know when I look at the median data for 2022 some firms you know their median income levels are around $47,000 a year, which is $23 an hour. That's just slightly more than the minimum wage at the moment. So that really brings into question, well, how much do you value the people who work for you who are often front-facing, who are providing that end service or product? They're the last connection that that customer has with your business. And thinking more about how do you affect change in a way that shows value to those people so that they can also participate in the profit sharing uh, opportunities that come through the, the growth of your enterprise and the quality of what you do. So I think it has to go beyond just thinking about minimums. We really need to think about adding value to individuals in a way that is recognised through how they contribute to what the business does as a whole. Oh, thank you, Helen. Sure, though. Question, and I'm going to direct this one at Melissa. Mm. How can tertiary education providers increase student retention, particularly of students from low SES backgrounds? Um, I, I firmly believe, which is a conversation we have quite often um, here at university, is the approach of meaningful engagement, and that's through the holistic approach of understanding that with parity groups, as seen by TEC and MOE, um, you know, Pacific and Māori students is you don't just focus in on the student, it's what comes with the student, it's mm. who's around the student, it's the environment, um, and yeah. it's also looking at uh, the structures that you have in place within your tertiary education provider and whether they are competent in being able to address um, some of our parity groups and the competent is in not just cultural competency because I think mm -hmm. when we say cultural competency it's more 
the behavioral application of mm. cultural competence. I think that's not enough. It needs to have more of a lens around cultural intelligence. And so I think, and that's more the understanding of why students struggle to put their hand up in lectures. You know, why students uh, need to go to a tangi that might take 10 days, 10 days. to two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then understanding that um, grades are also a massive contributor to retention. So being uh, empathetic in grades and not saying, I'm not saying, you know, let's lessen the standard of, of, um, of our grades, but more so understanding that whatever grade you give a student uh, that you've considered their background, especially if they've come for extension, but also um, what they can do for them and them staying here, because it doesn't seem like a big thing that tertiary education providers have fully grasped, but we have as student associations, is that grades are a huge... Um, a bit of assessment methods, you know, the long yeah. essays. Does that have to change? Oh. Big time. I think these other ways of being, <laughs> as I go into this doctorate, but I think these other ways of being able to measure the students' understanding in the same. Totally agree with you. But, but yeah. I also think, um, I, th I think, and particularly for oral cultures, mm. for cultures where um, people are generally more extroverted, better on their feet, and the way they can think and all that kind of things, um, we do have to look at other forms of assessment. Because, you know, if you think of the the stuff that's regurgitated at stage one and two, mm -hmm. when really you're after thinking, <laughs> thinking, and you're wanting people to grasp kind of broad concepts and work their way through them, I think um, we've got to be really creative in assessments. And again, it's another thing that came out of COVID. People started to think differently about a whole lot of those things. Mm -hmm. And also, what's the point of all this knowledge if we can't change that, we can't change that. Well, we don't work towards it. Well, the themes that's coming through the questions is about how do we change, right? Yes. Uh, and I mean that's the that's the real question. And if you were talking about significant change that is required in this space, or in, for example, in a Ranga Tamariki and how they operate, you are um, challenged at, on multiple fronts. What happened with Ranga Tamariki, as I remember, because I I was on the small group that wrote the report that led to the government of the day sitting up Oranga Tamariki to try and improve upon children and young persons family service um, is that it was accepted the idea of culture change was something easy to talk about and became incredibly difficult to do and in, in, in a sense in a in essence was not done there was a change of building there was a change of name but the same people from the old organization moved into the driver's seat. And so what did you get after five or six years of the change? Not much of it. And what it changed in, an, in, a, in an honest attempt to improve things was some things got changed for the worse, as we are all are well aware of in New Zealand now. Uh, so the irony of it, for me at least, is that every time this issue comes up in the context of Oranga Tamariki, everyone says there's a thousand reports. Why don't we just get on and fix the problem? I get that. Mm. But the report I was involved in made a very important point. More than a hundred times, someone's gone through and counted the number of times this was said, which is if this does not work for Maori, it will not work for New Zealand. Mm. Because 68% of the clients, children in care, mm -hmm. were those people. Mm. Maori, right? By no, that's what I mean. So if you didn't build a service that was attuned and prioritized Maori um, worldviews, ways of preferred ways of operating it was doomed to failure and guess what happened I mean, it's not over and it's still recoverable but it's been much longer to get to that cultural change position where things will fundamentally alter now that sounds like i'm blaming someone i'm not blaming anyone because real change is bloody hard mm -hmm. human beings by definition, are almost invested in the status quo because they don't like uncertainty and they don't particularly like change. So what we're up against here is something that's always been a challenge throughout history and across the world. So if we can just get that on the table and stop blaming each other and stop um, passing the buck, uh, do what we can at our level and position, and then hopefully when we move to more collective orientation in society as opposed to the individual, individualistic sort of American idea, mm. things will start to accrue and aggregate and we'll get a bit of wind in our sails. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we need to work out a, a method of interacting with each other, depending on, you know, 
regardless of political background or beliefs, in a way where we don't do the typical New Zealand things, which is either um, be pleasant and stab the people behind their back once they're out of the room, <laughs> or get incredibly strident and start yelling. There's a, there's a median um, middle ground where we can express our views honestly to get to the root of the problem, but respectfully. And I don't think culturally we're quite up to that yet, but I'd be interested in what my panel colleagues uh, think about that. We're going to start wrapping up soon. Okay. One final question, Shane, you're the one who's passionate about child poverty. What are the factors, factors that contribute to child poverty and how can we get rid of it? I think that everyone here yeah. is utterly passionate about child poverty. And I also think most of Aotearoa New Zealanders. Mm -hmm. And so I'm I'm trying to to think in what I think is a new way of thinking about this. And that is what does a decolonized child protection system look like in Aotearoa in the 21st century? And the first thing I would say is we're all on the same side. It's not an issue of separating us and government. Um, we all have to work in this. And so I, for me, I, I see um, housing, employment, education, justice, mm -hmm. corrections, health, mm -hmm. Māori NGOs, community NGOs, kainga order, the whole nine yards, us, mm. um, rather than a us and them. Because I think the first thing, and it's probably, and a number of my colleagues, especially Māori colleagues, may not like this, but oh, I don't think the state can ever abrogate its responsibility for this. So therefore, the state will always have a role. And so when I think about by Māori, for Māori, and with Māori, um, I think if it's if it's good for Māori, it will be good for all of us. And so, and so when I think about if we start to front load and invest in all those things for children, and so for instance, in Kainga Ora, we prioritise seventy percent of those houses for. And please, I'm not speaking. You know, this is just these are just ideas for children that have families. We say to family court judges or district court judges, you can't sentence anyone unless a report has been done on the status of those children. Um, we say to employers, if you employ someone who has three kids, we'll give you a tax incentive for you to employ those kids, which, by the way, is what they did with drug addicts in Portugal. Mm. You know, they paid people to employ them. Their rates of addiction went through the floor. You know, their rates of overdoses went through the floor. Mm -hmm. And no, it didn't lead to other drugs, mm -hmm. you know. So we can start thinking about this far more broadly. Can I pick up on that and say that we need to have a sharing of control and resource between government and communities? And that will start with genuine respect for the wisdom that exists within communities. And you see grassroots examples of that the, all over New, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Mm -hmm. The vaccination issue was um, highlighted the capacity of certain groups within society to get up and get going without, as some might put it, government interference. What we need is a genuine devolution of power from central to a more equal, equitable sharing of power, control, and resources. And resources. In other words, Politicians go back to their old kind of in theory role, which is the servants of the people. So the people really matter, but these days they can sit around the top table or representatives of the of the people to make these decisions about how we attack wicked problems like poverty. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to make the point in the question before about um, what could we do mostly. I mean, I think really good public housing be it community absolutely uh, council is critical and I often ask people well what portion of do you think we have in New Zealand of that what proportion of public housing do you think we've got 15 percent just 15? Yeah. uh yeah I'd guess um guess 15. Four percent. Four percent. Four percent. And that, and if you are in public housing, that 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 proportion mm -hmm. is set by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development and goes through MSD. We can't just build more. We have to decide that is a not not enough um, housing, public housing of very good quality, very well supported. 
And uh, if you're in the private rental sector, other than paying, if you're in public housing, you pay 25% of your household income, no more than that. Mm -hmm. But if, there are many people now paying 50%, 60% of their income just to try and have a roof over their head. So I think that that's, we've got to get the balance correct there. Um, and just, we've mm -hmm. had one that we've flipped over here, can I just talk about that? That that the power block about saying um, when the government announced today, where the mm. question do you want to? The, the, the question was asked. Can I say? What shall I say? Yeah, yeah, that, right. that asked that there was a, going to be a tax on the um, um, the, the administration, the contracting, the people mm. who arranged Ki Kiwi Bank, and it was immediately, oh, they're just going to tax our Kiwi Bank. It isn't. It was financial services, but there was a pushback from that industry really, really heavily, and and the government has, you know, pulled it. Mm. Um, yeah. So we've got just a few minutes left, and, and here's a question for all of our panelists. What are we doing right in Aotearoa? Are we making progress? And if you had the power to make one change, what would it be? Let's go backwards because I want to end with Melissa. So, Philippa. No, you have to think about it a minute. <laughs> <laughs> start, start here. I'm okay, we'll on. start with Helen. Uh, what are we doing right? I think if we can uh, continue to get our kids to school every day, if we can support each other in community, like Richie is saying, we have to to look after one another and similar to what Shane has been saying, when someone's in need, reach out, help them, encourage them. When you see a family struggling, do something to make a difference. Uh, one thing that we could do, if um, I wanted to make change, one, one thing I would do is bring more support into schools. I think schools are a central part of our community where children are involved. So bringing in mentors, bringing in people who can get alongside families where they need support, connecting families to schools, to medical resources and other resources that they need and helping to solve problems at that level rather than leaving individuals to rely on agencies. That would be my one final uh, recommendation. Thank you. Shane. Oh, I've got a few things I'd like to do. One minute. <laughs> okay. Um, I would like the... Um, all of the CEs of some of the ministries I've mentioned to have treaty clauses and child-friendly clauses mm. in their KPIs, um, just for starters, but also subsequent policy to reflect that in terms of housing, education, corrections, and all of all of that. Um, and then, as a parting shot, if if I had, you know. Um, $100 million at the moment, I'd like to buy something that competes with the duopoly that controls our supermarkets right. and put cheap food mm -hmm. for all of Aotearoa. Um, because when I think about housing, food and energy, they're basics that make each of us feel fully human. And we've let the market control that. And it's just been greedy. Mm. Okay, and so what are we doing right? And I think we've just gone through the you know the most traumatic thing many of us all go in our lifetimes in COVID. And I've just finished writing a book with colleagues from fifteen countries around the world, and there's no doubt we've come out of that much better than any other country. So I, I, I mean, <laughs> so it's like. I think we often, I, the radio turns on and people are complaining about things and this and that and stuff. But there are many things that we're making progress in, you know, with all the issues that we've identified around. Oh. I feel really proud about the sort of co-governance and tititi, you know, I compare mm -hmm. what's happening in Australia and I think, oh my goodness. And so if I had the power to make change, I'd... I'd, I'd take the lessons from COVID that we were too slow in actually reaching out in a formal way to Pacific and Māori communities and making that at the beginning and, and, and starting from there the next time something happens. And if I had power to do something, I'd say I'd take up your 15% of public housing <laughs> and I'd make sure that there's money that enabled us to do this, picking up the kids who are going through right. apprenticeships, the Māori companies. And the last thing I'd do is I'd, instead of sending all our wood overseas, I'd have to cross laminated timber and build a new iconic kind of state housing. Oh. I love it. <laughs> Magnificent. Uh, so what are we doing right? Well, we've uh, we've targeted uh, 
poverty as a, a major issue. We have some legislation that will support us moving further in the right direction. We need to put that on steroids. Uh, and if there was sure. um, the power to, do, to make a single change, um, it would be to convince all political parties um, that prevention is worth investing in. Everyone yeah. will acknowledge yeah, yeah. the rationale for <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah, front loaded. The nature of politics and three-year cycles, they don't want to invest in something now that the next crew or the crew after that will get the uh, plaudits for. They need to get beyond those selfish needs mm -hmm. and probably invest in prevention, nipping in the bud the many causal pathways that lead to, including and driven largely by poverty, not, not solely, nipping that in the bud as early as you can. So we don't have 6,000 young people through no fault of their own ripped from their whānau mm -hmm. for various reasons, which is a traumatic event unto itself. Sure not. And once you're in the system, guess what happens? You get bounced from pillar to post and get a sense of, like, no one cares about me, no one loves me, and there's no stability ever mm -hmm. um, waiting for me. And that is further damaging. So we've got an inquiry into state abuse, um, but there's a soft form of abuse. It's not intended, of course, but that is the consequence. Uh, so if we can drop it from 6,000 by 90% in the next 10 years, that'd be great. And mm. same with prisons. Daughter. Exactly the same yeah. with prisons. Well, actually, I know we. this is a good news story. Under the radar, the prison population has dropped by 3,000 yeah. well, in the last um, four years, five years. Now, in real figures, that's 300 million in savings. In savings. That can go into preventative things. Exactly. Yeah. Into front loading for children and whānau. I'm going to gonna have to end it here, oh. Melissa. Hmm? <laughs> all right. Um, we could do it on all what night. Are we, <laughs> what are we doing right at Aotearoa? I think I want to give this time and acknowledge our you know, communities, our grassroots yes. communities, um, for their mobilisation and work behind the scenes. Um, and that's not off the work of government. They didn't have to wait, especially during COVID. I think we need to recognise that they are champions of their communities. And slowly but surely, I think, um, you know, those in power are starting to listen, which is good. And I'm hopeful that that relationship um, can lead to something greater. And if I had a power, it would be to instill more bravery um, in a lot of our decision makers, you know, and it's as a young person, we often sit and talk and we're like, man, someone just, just be brave, like capital gains tax, just do it. You know, that moment yeah. we all waited for. And so just some bravery would be, you know, show us so that we can feel that we're stepping into something that is already safe and already ready what the difference that will bring, yeah. Malo. Malo. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panel for your contributions tonight. Thank you to all those people watching live tonight. We've loved every minute of it. Hopefully we've ruffled some feathers and pushed it to the edge and made you think. Thank you to our staff in the back who have been absolutely wonderful. Yeah, take a bow, take a bow. Thank you to all the panellists and all the previous winter symposiums. And we began with Karakia. Mr. Workman, could you please come forward, stand on your X, and end us with Karakia. <laughs> Kia ora. Yeah. Still... And I'll give you a glass of water. <laughs> Thank you, Wayne, very much. Yeah, you're so good at this. Right. Tiger waits to see if you're watching. You want to <laughs> you're available. He, he means it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>Me te whiwhinga tahi tanga ki te wairua tapu. Ake, ake, ake. Amen. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora.